Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Hello. I'd like to welcome you to this, the 12th LaFontaine Baldwin Symposium. My name is Anthony Cimolino. I'm the Artistic Director of the Stratford Festival of Canada, and we are co-presenting this special event with the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, led, of course, by the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson and John Rostin Saul. I want to thank you for being part of this very special day, and we're live streaming this around the world. We would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge the land that we're on, which currently is under the care of the Mississaugas of New Credit. I'd also like to recognize the multiple Indigenous nations that have traveled on and used this land and territory throughout the ages, and which continues today. Today's very special event is a partnership, is part of a partnership between the Institute for Canadian Citizenship and the Stratford Festival. And we are thrilled to have this as something that is part of the Stratford Festival Forum. And for those of you who don't know, the Stratford Festival Forum is composed of over 200 different events that happen during the festival season that link the plays and the themes and ideas that are in those plays in the Stratford Festival season with the world that we live in today. And they range from comedy nights to, to music concerts to special talks by extraordinary people. Uh, this past year, we had just recently uh, the Chief Justice of the Canadian Supreme Court, Beverly McLaughlin, with us. We had retired General Romeo Dallaire. Uh, we had different talks given by people in, so, from such a wide range as Margaret Trudeau, Gian Gameshi. We had artists, Hoxley Works, Workman, Stephen Page, Colin Mockery, all were part of this special examination, exploration, and celebration of the festival's playbill. And today is the last forum event, and we can't think of a more fitting conclusion than this symposium, as it features one of Canada's most influential directors, our own Le Robert Lepage. The, I want to just highlight the partnership, which is very special to us at Stratford, between the Institute for Canadian Citizenship. Last year, we held the 11th LaFontaine Baldwin Symposium in Stratford, and the person who was at the center of that last year was the then chief of our First Nations, Sean Atlio, and he spoke about the contemporary role of the First Nations in, in leading the evolution of Canadian culture into the future. The ICC and Stratford shares a very, some very important mutual goals, which are inclusivity and also, of course, engaging citizenship through culture and through the arts. And our forum began this year in Toronto, and today we are ending the Stratford Festival Forum again in Toronto because we hope to reach out to people here in the city who maybe haven't had a chance to take in this past year, but we will welcome you to Stratford next year. I should say that we still have one more week of King Lear playing in Stratford. <laughs> Little plug. Um, now, for those of you who are already bored of your first speaker and are rightly reading your programs, you'll notice that I'm about to ex uh, introduce uh, a wonderful individual, Adrian Clarkson. But instead, we're going to shake it up. We're going to move things around. I have instead, and Adrian, by the way, saw King Lear three times. Um, <laughs> I have instead the honor of introducing uh, her partner at the ICC, an individual who saw King Lear twice, John Ralston Saul. <laughs> yes. Uh, now, it is a pleasure to introduce John. John is literally the man who wrote the book on LaFontaine Baldwin, and he did that as as part of his responsibilities, he was the editor of a series with Penguin Canada called Extraordinary Canadians. And the book describes these two leaders and how they came together, first in 1841, and then the years that followed, how they set about really creating the programs and the principles that led to modern Canada over those years. But John has written many books, all of them refreshing. He is an original and uh, an enlightening voice. He's uh, Voltaire's Bastards, for instance, The Unconscious Civilization, which won the Governor General's Award, A Fair Country. His is a voice in this corporate age, in this rational age, in this age of managers uh, that speaks to humanism, ethics, and common sense. And that, friends, is refreshing. He is also 
an international presence. He is the pre president of Penn International, which has over 150 different affiliates around the world. And this organization, which promotes and defends the free voice in the world, um, is extraordinarily important in the world we live in. It has been around for 93 years, and John is only the second person from North America to lead this organization. His new book, uh, The Comeback, was written in response in part to the talk given last year by Sean Atlio, and it is about the Aboriginal peoples of Canada and their comeback. I would like you to give a very warm welcome to John Ralston Saul. I deeply regret that I didn't see it three times. <laughs> it is, if I'm allowed to plug, I think, uh, I've said this many times, I think it's the finest uh, King Lear I've ever seen anywhere in the world. And if you haven't seen it, you should grab the opportunity. Um, so welcome to the 12th La Fontaine Baldwin. Welcome to those who are watching via webcast. Uh, also later on, uh, those who are taking part in the live tweeting will have an opportunity during the question and answer period to try and get some questions in. Uh, bien sûr, si vous avez envie de poser des questions en français, il ne faut pas hésiter. Uh, on, on répondra en français, tous les, uh, tous les deux, évidemment, et Robert, bien sûr. Uh, welcome, I think, since the very first La Fontaine Baldwin lecture, welcome to CBC Radio, who are recording this lecture <coughs> to air on Ideas, the wonderful program Ideas, on October 29th at 9 p.m. So I said this is the 12th lecture. It's taken place all over the country, Halifax, Quebec City, Montreal, Calgary, Vancouver. And as you've heard, it's the second year we've worked with Stratford. Next year, we'll be back at Stratford. So we keep moving it around in a sense. Perhaps with Stratford, we'll go the next year to Vancouver. Who knows what we'll do? Um, and Sean Atlio was the third uh, Aboriginal leader to uh, give this lecture, which is really important to say because it is such an important area, I think the most important area uh, that the country faces today. Uh, but other lectures have been George, uh, George Erasmus, uh, Sila Watkuchi, the other two Aboriginals, but also Louise Arbour, um, and, C and uh, the Chief Justice of Canada, who's sitting in the audience, uh, and George Elliott Clark, who's sitting in the audience. So it's, it's really thrilling to know that four of the last 12 lecturers are actually here today, along with Adrian Clarkson and, and myself, since I had to get it going and kicked it off. Um, Anthony's given you a little idea, and some of you have heard this before, but it needs to be said again and again. Why is it called the La Fontaine Baldwin Symposium Lecture? Uh, because they created the idea of democracy as we know it in Canada today. Uh, the great ministry, which they formed in 1848, uh, they set the direction for what Canada, not necessarily what Canada always is, but what Canada could aspire to be. Uh, the ethical idea of Canada, the pluralist idea of Canada, the idea of Canada at its best. And it's, it's very Toronto. I mean, Baldwin was the greatest politician Toronto has ever produced. You wouldn't know it from the lack of statues and so on, but he is. Um, and they were brought to power, interestingly enough, uh, by the terrible potato famine in, uh, in, in Ireland. One of the three things that brought them to power, it got worse and worse through the 1840s. And in 1847, uh, tens of thousands of sick and dying, uh, uh, troubled, lost with uh, Irish uh, emigrants arrived in Quebec City and then in Montreal, and then most of them were sent by barges in even worse conditions uh, to Toronto. And it is almost the equivalent, since so many of them had typhus, of bringing boatloads of people with Ebola to Toronto. It was so irresponsible, it was the family compact. It was an in, in, uh, both, they were dying untreated, and it endangered the whole city of Toronto. And so the whole city had to come together to figure out how to save the day, and they moved them into hospitals, they moved them into farm, farming communities, and they, they fed them up, and so on. It was a real uh, community activity, in effect. And it, it, the failure of the anti-democratic movement in Canada uh, on that issue of the Irish emigrants uh, from Britain 
was one of the key factors in why the democratic forces were brought to power in the spring of 1848. Um, uh, Toronto, which had always voted against, voted for uh, democracy. And they came to power and in three years, they brought in uh, an open and fair justice system, public education, professional civil service, the end of the British and French official class structures, which is to say they did away with primogenitor and began the doing away with of the seniorial system, free roads for people, so it wasn't just for the rich, egalitarian post office, removal of imprisonment for debt, the beginning of public universities, which Baldwin started with the University of Toronto as a public university. And so all of this, those are the, the foundations on which the idea of a humanist Canada was born and organized. And we hope that this lecture series is a step towards bringing out voices of the key important Canadians and non-Canadians to talk about this. For example, the Aga Khan was the 10th lecturer and spoke about th th that idea of multiple origins, uh, uh, complex societies and people living together. So it was logical when uh, Adrian and I set up the Institute for Canadian Citizenship that we would bring the Lafontaine Baldwin lecture series symposium into it. I'd started it in 2000, in 1999, and we did the first one in 2000. But it was logical that it was, it was part of the idea of creating a conscious concept of citizenship in Canada. And you could say that in the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, which Adrian's gonna talk a bit about, that the, this, this symposium, this lecture series, is the intellectual platform of the Institute and it is one of the very few, if not the only intellectual public platforms for talking every year about citizenship and how it relates to democracy and the common good in Canada. Um, and there's, here's an interesting detail that we, we always say we're the cutting edge country in terms of immigration and citizenship and this city with more than 50% of its population born elsewhere and we make it work. But when we're asked how it works and why it works and what we do to make it work, we're pretty tongue tied. We don't really have an intellectual idea of how we're doing this thing. We're almost doing it by the seat of our pants, which you can only do for so long. And so the, the LaFontaine Baldwin Lecture is tied to a program of the ICC's called Insights, which we put together uh, working with, at this point, about 125,000 new Canadians. N no other organization has this relationship. And they're talking to us and we're talking to them to find ways for their voice to be heard and for them to become more and more involved in Canadian society. We need to know what they're thinking, what they're noticing, what they would like to be doing and are not, feel they're not able to do. We just brought out a study, for example, called, uh, which was about the connection between new Canadian and sports. And that was just the first study uh, coming out of this I Insights program and it, it's going to develop in a far, far wider way so that we get a, a better idea through the new Canadians of what citizenship can and should mean in Canada. So let me now turn the mic over to this year's Massey lecturer, uh, the 26th Governor General of Canada, most important, the co-chair of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, uh, the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson. Welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to see this wonderful theater filled to listen to one of the most remarkable Canadians who exists on, on our earth today. And um, I'm delighted that in our audience we have the Chief Justice of Canada. Uh, it's a great honor to have her here. She's a, a past LaFontaine Baldwin speaker. We also have um, Tricia Baldwin and her mother, Laura Baldwin, the direct descendants of Robert Baldwin. And this is always an honor for us um, in a country that considers itself to be young. We have very old roots and the Baldwins represent that. And we're grateful always for their interest and the way they have uh, always supported us in this. Thank you very much, Trisha and Laura. We really had another order of things, as you can see in your program, and then we decided that I had to introduce Robert because I'm the one that's known him the longest. And it was through my program, Adrian Clarkson Presents, that I first met Robert, who 
already was emerging as a genius of the theater in Quebec and uh, was making uh, quite an inroads here in Toronto, up here uh, with many productions that people were noticing. And every time I saw a production of his, I was completely taken with it. I remember, you remember images when you see theater, right? And I remember one image of a white bed with a white girl in a white nightgown lying there and suddenly from the ceiling thousands of rosaries dropped on top of her. That kind of image you never forget. Or I was in Montreal at the Théâtre de Cadsou and Robert himself was playing, um, was playing a detective in the polygraph, the lie detector, and suddenly he turned a wall into a floor simply by moving his foot up and I realized only a man of the theater can do something like that. Also, we worked together on his production of Tectonic Plates, which I presented as a film. I covered his work on Seven Streams of the River Ota, which uh, opened the Edinburgh Festival. Uh, he did Elsinore, he did La, La Face Cachée, La Lune. He did Needles and Opium first as a one-man show himself. Now it's a, developed into another kind of show with a another kind of space development, which you'll be able to see again in the spring here at Canadian Stage. He did the Nightingale at the Canadian Opera Company here where the orchestra pit was filled with water and Bunraku puppets were used to enormous effect. I also saw it at Aix-en-Provence where it caused a sensation. He did the Ring at the Metropolitan Opera. C'est quelqu'un vraiment qui fait n'importe quoi et non, c'est pas n'importe comment, il le fait, il le fait avec le génie total. Alors c'est euh, plutôt dans le film aussi qu'il a fait ses marques. Euh, il a eu pour le confessionnal son film d'il y a 15 ans. Il a eu euh, tous les lauréats possibles pour ça. Il est officier de l'Ordre du Canada. Il est officier de l'Ordre national de Québec. Il a eu le génie pour le confessionnal. Il a eu, euh, il était le dixième lauréat du prix Glenn Gould euh, l'année dernière. Et euh, c'est quelqu'un vraiment qui connaît pas simplement les honneurs euh, ici, mais aussi au-delà, euh, hors de nos frontières. C'est très intéressant parce qu'il a choisi ces thèmes très intéressants qui sont, ils sont toujours quelque chose qui, qui, qui est uniquement Robert Lepage. Robert Lepage covers identity, and that is very essential uh, to citizenship. Identity is sexual, identity is national. He covers borders, national borders, transgressional borders um, in the mind and spirit. You know, the ICC basically has a cultural aspect to it because we give what's called a cultural access pass to all new citizens in Canada, uh, which makes uh, available to them free uh, access to about 1,200 places across the country uh, 1,200 uh, cultural institutions like the ROM here, um, like the AGO, like the Victoria Art Gallery, um, like the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, uh, free for one year to new citizens with their children up to four in their families. And it's from there that we have our great insights program. And we want to actually always give that access to culture to new citizens because that is why we founded the Institute for Canadian Citizenship because all of our history, all of our culture is as important to people who just become new citizens as the people who have been here creating it for the last 200 and 300 years. That's what we want to do with this Institute of Canadian Citizenship. That is what is important to us because the identification of being a citizen in this country is the most profound act of imagination that you could possibly think of. The act of imagination of being a citizen is uniquely Canadian. In other countries, they are a country. They say what a citizen is, and you have to fit in. In Canada, we believe that you become a citizen, and you bring with it all the sum of your traditions, everywhere you've been, what you are, your religion, your race, everything, your language, and you become something that creates what is a Canadian citizen. That's where our act of imagination comes in, and that's where we are as the Institute for Canadian Citizenship. I'm very happy that we have this kind of link with the LaFontaine Baldwin 
symposium because that gives us an intellectual podium which is unique. And having somebody like Robert Lepage who has been able to work in theater, film, opera, circus um, is something which is extraordinary to us. He also has a very close connection with the Aboriginals in this country. He is from Quebec City. He is very much a Quebec City person, even though he grew up all across this country because his father's work and is completely and utterly bilingual. He worked with the Aboriginals to create a version of the Tempest um, at Wendake, at the at territory just outside Quebec City. He's very close to them. And he did, it's interesting, he did the Tempest at the Metropolitan Opera, which was the Thomas Addis new opera, and he also did it with the Wendaki. This is the kind of person that Robert Lepage is. Just in case you want to know, Wendaki is just on the St. Charles River, about 15 minutes from Quebec City, and I urge you to go there if you were ever visiting Quebec City. It's a wonderful place. Il a été pendant des années uh, aussi chef du Théâtre français au Centre National des Arts à Ottawa, où il a inauguré des choses tout à fait extraordinaires. C'est un tel génie qu'il y a des choses, les miettes, si on peut le dire, qu'il a laissées derrière lui, qui sont des choses qui auraient pu être des choses les plus extraordinaires pour des autres qui sont moins grands que lui. Euh, il est créateur, il est démiurge, il est québécois, il est canadien, il est Robert Lepage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, something Tony did not mention at the beginning. I also saw King Lear uh, <laughs> in Stratford. It was a wonderful production, but I only saw it once. So. Um, it's a great pleasure being here this afternoon. Um, when I was asked to come and deliver this talk, um, I very, very naturally uh, agreed to do it because uh, the theme of identity and the theme of belonging <coughs> have always been central to my work as an artist for the past 35 years. Uh, I've done many things, as uh, uh, Adrian so elegantly uh, said. Uh, I've done a lot of work in opera, circus, uh, film, but uh, my main uh, my main world is the theater world, and uh, I have worked there as an actor, as a director mainly, and also as a writer. And uh, as a writer, actually, we work in a collective manner. I work with um, uh, artists from all over the world, so most of our work is not just Quebec-based. It's also uh, in many languages, and, and we get to co-produce with uh, uh, festivals and theater companies from around the world. Um, the, uh, the very first big collective show that I did that uh, propelled my work uh, into, into the uh, international spectrum was a show called The Dragon's Trilogy, which uh, explored, of course, our relationship with the Chinese communities of Canada. And it was a show that lasted, it was, uh, it was a six-hour show. Uh, and it was worth every minute of it. Uh, and it, it kind of spanned over 75 years. Uh, later on, we, we uh, devised another piece uh, called The Seven Streams of the River Ota, uh, mainly about the 50 years that followed the uh, Hiroshima tragedy. This one was much more about displacement, how uh, populations and individuals uh, were displaced uh, by the war, whether the, the, the war with the Japanese or uh, the uh, Second World War in Europe. So um, this one was a seven-hour show. And then we devised a nine-hour show, it just get longer as, <laughs> as we go, uh, called Lip Sync, which was uh, a study on um, identity uh, connected to the theme of voice, speech, and language, which of course is a, a theme that we will be discussing today uh, during this talk. Uh, also, I'm, I've been very, um, busy doing one-man shows, uh, you know, in the midst of doing all these collective writings. I've done many solo shows that I've been performing myself, and um, they're all pretty much auto-fiction, even though I'm uh, too chicken to actually use my own name in these games. <laughs> I usually call myself Philippe or find some other name, but actually it, they're very autobiographical, and um, a lot of those stories are about how you find your identity uh, elsewhere. Um, 
either because you can't really find it in your own community or that you feel that uh, you have to go and hide somewhere to understand who you are. And of course, you're not really hiding from anybody because you're confronted to somebody else's culture and to somebody else's society or identity. So that's pretty much what my work is about. And I'm pretty much obsessed by these themes of identity and belonging. Um, I started to be, uh, I'd say, I tried to remember and go as far back as I could when I started to be interesting about, about that specific thing of belonging. And, and uh, it had to do uh, with when I came out of the conservatory. Um, I was brought up in the 60s and 70s. I'm from the generation in Quebec City where uh, people were kind of forced to speak English as a second language, but there was not really any use for it. Um, I didn't see how, you know, there was no there was nothing practical about speaking English when you were brought up in Quebec City. And it was in, you know, the great years of nationalism and sovereignty and separatism in, in Quebec. So, of course, you know, that was an interesting project. And uh, so um, if you were a 20-year-old uh, Quebecois francophone that traveled, um, you didn't feel you belonged to a place called Canada. You were a Quebecer, and that was it. And, you know, for I'd say that a lot of people, a lot of my friends, and we, we discussed this, and nobody would actually feel uh, Canadian. And uh, I got to do my first trip to Europe, uh, backpacking, and uh, I remember one day uh, going to the Piazza San Marco in Venice and came across these two, this couple, uh, who also were backpacking uh, from Edmonton, Alberta, and uh, I knew they were Canadian because they had small Canadian flags on their, back, their pack sacks. And we were queuing for the same museum or something. I don't remember what it was exactly. And of course, you say, oh, you're from Canada. Where are you from? We're part of Canada. And you start talking. And we kind of became friends. And, and uh, that evening, we went out for drinks and met with other people, uh, Italians and people from Germany. And I realized that I was part of a reality that I had never felt that I was part of before. Um, and I was introduced to them by these two people by, as fellow Canadians, and it felt right, which was kind of odd. So it's the first time that I felt really Canadian, that I could actually identify to something called Canada. And it, it always remained, and it's still quite mysterious to this day, <laughs> and I hope that uh, these forums could help uh, clarify what this is about. But I so said, okay, why is it that I don't feel Canadian when I'm in Canada? and I feel Canadian when I'm abroad. <laughs> and so it's a bit of an odd feeling, but at the same time, it kind of gives you hope that, you know, in this world of Arabs and Jews, Catholics and Protestants, black and white, whatever the conflicts are, whatever uh, the paradoxes are, um, it means that if Martians would attack us, we'd all be earthlings, you know? We'd all feel that we're part of the same place. And uh, that was kind of confirmed to me by um, uh, Guy Laliberté, who was the, uh, the big boss at uh, Cirque du Soleil, who actually got to uh, uh, go in outer space, uh, visited the uh, space station, because he's a multi-billionaire, so he could afford <laughs> flying there. And he went there for 10 days, and he said, it's really the feeling that you have, because you're so outside of all the different cultural uh, uh, barriers or identifications, you know, that you feel, everybody in, in the shuttle or in the space station, whether they're Russian or taikonauts, cosmonauts, astronauts, they're all Earthlings. And I know that, you know, we can't all experiment that and actually go out there <laughs> and say, oh, we're actually all from the same place. But there is something about that phenomenon that intrigued me and, and uh, kind of forced me to acknowledge it and to explore that theme. Um, when I, my work started to, uh, to be exported and I started to do uh, more and more touring, um, I was asked a lot to either deliver lectures or to uh, do seminars uh, for a couple of days with some theater students or with, you know, uh, in theater festivals where there would be people from all over the place. And of course, if you're going to spend a couple of days devising uh, a short piece of work, you want to know uh, who, who it is that you're working with. And a way to do that is I, I would always kind of unroll a very long uh, roll of paper on the floor and I put some markers and crayons and I say, okay, we're gonna draw a map of the world. And uh, so people would spend about half an hour, we'd play music and they would draw a map of the world. And anywhere this would happen, any country in the world where I did this, they would always put the Americas in the center, right? Of course, Europe would be on this side and Asia and Australia would be on this side. And, uh, and I'd always be, 
know, amazed, uh, even if when, when there were no Americans in the room, how everybody knew exactly how the United States was shaped. You know, the, the panhandle of Florida, and they all knew where Miami was and where Cuba was, and of course, and even Australia. I mean, so, but when they got to, dr to uh, dry, draw Canada, they would go up north, and then there was this blob. <laughs> and it would just kind of go and go this way. And I was fine, my God, nobody knows anything about what this country looks like, and they can map a small, uh, a small island in the Pacific, and they don't know anything about this huge, important country, which is called Canada. And most of them thought that, of course, the capital of Canada was Montreal, and they would place Montreal in the middle of the blob, <laughs> where Sault Ste. Marie is. And, uh, and I was always be, you know, a bit embarrassed that I came from a place nobody knew anything about. And one day, um, because I'm uh, not only did they have to draw a map of the world, but they were allowed to make comments, little arrows and little comments they would write and some jokes. And you could see politically where they were and you could see what they thought of what was going on in the world today. And one guy one day on the big giant blob wrote, open country. And all other countries had been identified with their proper names, but there was no Canada. There was open country. And I said, well, what do you mean by open country? It's just like, it's just big, massive land with nobody in it. And we say, yeah, but it's also because Canadians are open. They're open people. It's open country. It's a, and it's, you know, there's a lot of space in Canada physically, but there's a lot of space in the mind. So I said, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, we, we have a reputation of being very, very open. And, I, and it kind of corresponded to the feeling I had of Australia. The first time I visited Australia, which is a huge territory, very few people, like in Canada, a lot of space physically, but a lot of space in the mind, two very young countries where everything is to be invented. And that felt very comfortable. And uh, I wasn't embarrassed anymore of being a citizen of a blob or anything. You know, it was just, you know, like a very, very positive thing. It was a way to, uh, uh, to change that into a very, very creative um, uh, piece of information. Now, um, I've often been asked to, um, as a theater director uh, who devises plays collectively, to one day do uh, a play about Canada. And I don't do these kind of things. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't say yes to commissions like that. It's too complicated. But what I do is that I try to use metaphors often for these commissions. And, and uh, what I would do instead of doing a show about Canada, I would use uh, my family, my own family, as a metaphor for Canada. So if you don't mind, for the next couple of minutes, I'm just going to uh, do a little bit of uh, family history here so you'll understand why I'm saying that my family is a perfect metaphor for Canada. Is that uh, My father and mother are uh, French-Canadian from Quebec City, and um, my father, of course, it was during the Depression years, uh, it was in the time when people would pull children out of schools, and my father was eight, and uh, he was sent to work in the shipyards and in the, on the docks in Quebec City. Uh, and uh, of course, he was, kids would be offered to be paid either with candies or cigarettes. And of course, my father said cigarettes because it was more a manly thing to do. And um, and then after that, he met my mother, and they they got engaged. And uh, the war, the Second World War, broke out. And because my father had worked in the uh, shipyards, knew all about ships, so of course he enrolled into the Canadian Navy. My my mother enrolled into the Canadian Army, uh, Canadian Army Women's Corps. Canadian Women's Army Corps, or quack, whatever, and they uh, and she was sent to England. So they went and spent about uh, three years uh, in their service. And when they came back, they got married. But of course, both of them had learned English by that time. Before that, they were uni unilingual French. Now they were uh, speaking English, and my father was uh, practically bilingual, and very proud of that. Very very proud to to actually speak both languages so easily. Because he was in the Navy, uh, they were sent to Nova Scotia uh, because in Halifax and Dartmouth there were some naval bases there and uh, they were trying very hard to have children, but my mother would always have uh, miscarriages. So at one point they said, well, we're probably not gonna be able to have any kids, so maybe we should adopt kids. So they decided to adopt my older brother, Dave, and my older sister, Anne, and they were brought up in English because they were in a, an English-speaking province, and in those days, uh, in Halifax, there were no French-speaking 
uh, schools. So they started their elementary school uh, in the English language. And then after that, uh, they were transferred back to Quebec City. And then my mother was able uh, to deliver uh, a child until the very end of her pregnancy. So I was born and my younger sister Linda was born. And uh, we were sent to French speaking school. So, uh, and my older brother and older sister were sent to uh, St. Patrick's School, which was the local uh, English speaking Irish Catholic school. So, of course, they would hang out with their English friends, and my sister and I would hang out with our French friends. And uh, we all got along pretty well, and I think the family was very harmonious, until Saturday nights when we had hockey night in Canada. <laughs> and um, in Quebec City in those days, there were two TV networks, uh, there were two channels, basically, Channel 4, Channel 5. Channel 4 was uh, a kind of amalgamation of uh, French CBC with some private uh, programs coming from Montreal. Uh, that was on Channel 4 and Channel 5 was uh, English CBC with uh, some early shows of the CTV. But on Saturday nights when hockey uh, was being uh, aired, um, they, would, it, they would beam the same signal on both channels, but if you switched to Channel 4, you'd have the French commentator, and you switch to Channel 5, you had the English uh, commentator. And it would be like the biggest tug of war you could ever see where my brother and I would be fighting to, you know, no, we want to watch it in French, no, we want to watch it in English. And we'd be always kind of switching channels. And of course, my father would take for my brother and my mother would take for myself because my mother was always a sovereignist. So anyways, <laughs> so it was a huge mess. And uh, eventually, because my, father, my, my brother was, was uh, bigger than I was, he would almost always win and he, he would uh, steal the knob because in those days there were <laughs> knobs. And uh, until I found a pair of pliers where I could actually turn it back to French. So anyway, so, so that, that was pretty much uh, how, um, how, this, uh, how we dealt with it in, in the house. And uh, there's a moment where my brother um, f had this big identity crisis because his name was Dave. And it was very important that he wasn't called David. He was Dave, the English guy, Dave Lepage. And uh, <laughs> So a lot of the French Canadian kids in the neighborhood would beat him up because he was a maudit anglais, you know. Uh, so uh, when he turned 18, uh, chose to study psychology and eventually photography in uh, New Brunswick in an English-speaking uh, province, and where he thought he would feel at home and he would feel that he belonged somewhere. somewhere. And of course, he got there and with a name like Lepage. And he, of course, he, in the meantime, he chose a French-Canadian girlfriend from rivière du loup so that didn't help. And they were speaking French all the time, so he would be beaten up because he was a French pea soup. <laughs> so he, f he never felt that he belonged anywhere for a long time until he got a job in Ottawa. Now, of course, Ottawa is like the ideal bilingual city in Canada because uh, even bus drivers and uh, I think firemen have to prove that they're perfectly bilingual. So he actually got a job teaching photography, uh, photography at Carleton University and spent pretty much all of his life there raising his children in French. And they all had uh, have jobs now in an English uh, company. And, um, and he's still there today. And, it, and it's really where he felt he belonged. And it's, it, his identity is really, he's the Ottawa guy, definitely. Um, when I was a kid, when I was five years old, uh, I came down with a disease called alopecia. Uh, uh, of course, it wasn't called that like that in those days. It was uh, called cat's disease. But what it is basically is that uh, you lose your hair. And uh, so, of course, that was very uh, uh, tragical when it happened. I didn't really care because I was too young to really uh, know exactly what it was about and what it would entail later on. But uh, what happened is that, of course, you know, children are very, very cruel. And uh, if you come down with something like alopecia, or if you have any kind of uh, difference, of course, they make you feel like you don't belong. And they beat you up, and they call you names. And so, of course, I don't want to take the violins out and say, oh, poor me, and pity on my fate. But actually, uh, you know, it was a very, very, very tough uh, childhood. But today, what I find interesting about that is that um, it's not that I feel uh, that that thing has been resolved or that it doesn't. Uh, um, it doesn't bother me anymore. It's just that I feel that what happened is that it made me more conscious of what it is to come from a different country, be an, uh, if you're an immigrant or if you're from a different race or if you have a real handicap. 
uh, if, if you have any kind of physical difference or if you don't correspond to the, the canons, the, you know, the, the modern day canons of beauty. Or, uh, so I've always been extremely sensitive to that and, and um, thought, well, you know, it's all very politically correct to say that we're against racism and all of that, but you don't really know what it's about if you haven't been in a position where you've been secluded or, if you, or that you feel that you don't belong because um, people don't want to play with you or the people who want to play with you make fun of you or whatever it is. So, so for me, that was a very, very important um, thing in my life, uh, even though it doesn't really bother me anymore. But it, 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 to understand um, the, um, you know, from within uh, what it is to be different and, and I've, probably the reason why I don't like children, which is kind of odd, <laughs> it's not a nice thing to say, because you know, I always thought that uh, you know, childhood is a dress rehearsal for all the cruelties you'll be doing later on in society. So, <laughs> um, so as I said earlier, uh, I never felt that uh, when I was growing up in Quebec, that even though um, my father was kind of imposing this English language, even if he wasn't originally, it was in his mother tongue, that it was kind of forced onto me. And I, I didn't see any kind of use uh, to that until I got to travel and got to work and collaborate with other people. Um, when I started doing co-productions uh, with different uh, theaters around the world, uh, I started to appreciate the fact that I had been taught uh, English because I already, because with my French, my, my, my mother tongue, uh, was very useful. It, it served as a basis to understand Italian when I got to learn Italian and then Spanish and then Portuguese. And uh, English, of course, was very um, useful to um, start learning German when I started working in Germany, eventually Dutch, eventually uh, Scandinavian languages because I got to work in Sweden and Denmark and, and, and Norway. And all of that grouped together uh, was very useful when I got to work in Russia. And the Cyrillic that I got to identify and got to read helped me uh, find my way through uh, Greek cities and and when I started to work in Japan, the Portuguese that I knew helped me learn Japanese of all languages, because one third of the language is actually based on Japanese. Uh, uh, arigato is a mispronounced obrigado, basically. So, and all of the Chinese characters that I learned when I was learning Japanese were very useful finding my way in Shanghai. So I'm not saying this to kind of brag about all the languages I can read. I could only speak a few of them, but I could actually find my way uh, through, uh, and, and the most important thing about this is that when you speak another language, uh, you feel differently, you express a part of your personality that has never been expressed before or that is not, um, is not summoned uh, in, your, in your mother tongue. For example, right now, um, I'm much more relaxed than if I'd actually be doing this in French. Uh, because it's not my mother tongue, so I could actually be wrong. I could put on the Celine Dion accent, and you know, it's okay, you would excuse, uh, you know. It's not a problem, so I'm more relaxed, and it's kind of cool, and it's, uh, you know, English is kind of a, a language, all sorts of diagonals and stuff, and you know, it's, I kind of like uh, my English identity. But when I speak French, of course, I'm more, I'm more kind of high strung, and, I, it's a, and it's, I'm, I'm more scientific about it, and, and I have to get all the, uh, the verb tense is right, and you know, and when I speak Spanish, it's something else. When I speak Italian, it's something else, etc., etc. And all these personalities are not personalities that come out from somewhere. They 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 actually are within me. And uh, so, learning different languages not only makes you connect to the world and help you have X-ray eyes when you walk through a a town where things are written in a foreign language, not only it kind of helps you to reach out, it also makes you reach in. It makes you discover who you are. And there's tons of stuff in there that, you never th that only need a different language to make it come out. So um, something that's, uh, that I, I've uh, encountered at one point is that uh, there's this extraordinary lady uh, called Brenda Milner. And uh, she was the... Uh, uh, assistant of uh, Wilder Penfield of the Penfield Institute, and in the uh, in the 60s, uh, well, her her her, her uh, the section of in which she was working was uh, neuropsychology, and uh, she was very instrumental in uh, trying to identify how memory works and where it came from, and the uh, and, and, and of course that work helped understand Alzheimer's, and. Um, uh, 
she, uh, she and her uh, colleagues um, did some tests in Montreal on people who were unilingual and people who were patients who were bilingual and discovered that in the case of bilingual people, the onset of Alzheimer's disease uh, is postponed uh, an average of four years. So the more you speak languages, the healthier your brain is. And uh, I hope you actually get to uh, see one of her lectures. She's uh, 96, and uh, believe me, she has all her marbles. She's an extraordinary articulated lady who still gives conferences about the brain and about memory. Her, uh, she, she herself uh, was from, she was born in England, but she uh, went to work in Montreal at the Penfield Institute and was very happy actually to uh, get to work in English, but to live in French. And for her, that, that was like a, a, a key in understanding how the brain works and how memory works. Um, there's a kind of an uh, odd thing in Quebec, an expression, we say uh, Québécois pur laine. Now, what that means, Québécois pur laine, it means uh, pure wool. I'm a, I'm, made my, uh, I'm a Québécois made of pure wool. And I've been, I, brought, I was brought up with this, uh, this idea that I was a Québécois uh, pur laine because um, both my parents were French Canadian and uh, uh, my ancestor, uh, his name was Louis Lepage, and uh, he was one of the very, very early French settlers on the island of Orleans, not very far from Quebec City. Um, and he had two sons, uh, Pierre and Gabriel, Peter Gabriel. And uh, they, uh, him and his wife and his two sons actually plowed, were the first to, to, to uh, cultivate the land and uh, um, pretty much owned the island of Orleans, which is a huge, huge, huge chunk of land in uh, 1634. And of course, Louis Lepage and his wife died and this, the two sons inherited the land and like, you know, Cain and Abel fashion kind of fought. Uh, so the, the mini Pierre uh, went away and founded um, Rimouski, so he became the sieur of Rimouski. So in, in Quebec, uh, if your name is Lepage, uh, you, you, you're from I, one of the branches. You're either from the, uh, the mini from Rimouski or the nice diplomatic guy from uh, Lille d'Orléans. And of course, in the show business world, and I'm probably the only one from Lille d'Orléans. And uh, so, so for me, I always thought that, you know, I'm one of the early settlers, I'm, I'm from that uh, lineage. Um, until um, one day, you know that, that uh, the island of Orleans still today is pretty much um, rural, even though it is a suburb of Quebec City, and you still have traces of the 17th century there, some wells and some old houses that are 350 years old. And so in, in, the, uh, in the 60s, it was a great uh, film set uh, for a, um, a TV series called Pierre Lemoyne de Berville. Pierre Lemoyne de Berville was uh, an early French settler during the uh, New France period. And uh, the French television in France did a co-production with French CBC. And um, so they, they shot this uh, series. Uh, pretty much everything was shot in studios in Montreal, but all of the outside exterior shots were done on the island of Orleans. And of course, this uh, French hero uh, who would build forts and, and, and houses and would be constantly attacked by Iroquois. Um, and, um, but of course, in Quebec City, uh, it would try to find extras to play the Iroquois. And uh, it would be very politically incorrect to go and see the Hurons to play Iroquois. So they sent a uh, talent scout um, in Quebec City. And uh, the guy would kind of scout through bus drivers and taxi drivers to try to find people who would have some kind of aboriginal feature. And uh, so what they would do is that they would group these, these, uh, these taxi drivers and uh, bring them to a YMCA, ask them to strip down, uh, shave them, uh, put them in these communal showers, paint, send, you know, uh, throw red paint at them, put a black wig on, a loincloth, put them in a school bus, bring them to the island of Orleans and <laughs> ask them to ask like Iroquois. And um, so that's pretty much what you see in the series. All these Iroquois are taxi drivers from uh, downtown Quebec. <laughs> My father was a cab driver. And uh, he, of course, uh, refused uh, to, to, to do this. But of course, all of his uh, co-workers would try to coax him to say, come on, you're the one who's, who looks the most Indian. You know, you should do it. You look like an Indian. And, I, and uh, so that made, kind, of, kind of made me think, oh, well, maybe we do have some some aboriginal blood, and that makes it even more pure laine because it means that we're not like the Anglos, you know, we're it's French and 
and native and you know it's the real thing and it's real Quebec and so eventually when I when I turned 50 a friend of mine uh, had my uh, family tree done uh, gave me this as a gift and um, so I just kind of you know sifted through all of the names and trying to see if there was some uh, hoping to find some some uh, Iroquois or Huron blood and there was like in hundreds and hundreds of names, there was a, a, a guy called Picard who could have been a Huron because Picard was a name that you would, you'd, you'd bump into a lot in, in, uh, in the Huron village. But other than that, there was no traces. So I thought, well, maybe I should look on my mother's side. And on my mother's side, there were all these um, Americans with people coming from Scotland and Ireland and, you know, uh, Wales. And then, you know, you discovered that actually I had a lot of Anglo blood within me, and that there is no such thing in Quebec as pure wool. Right? Um, there's, I've, of course, as a, a, um, a theater person, um, I feel more comfortable if I, I bring props. So, of course, I, I brought a few props with me. Uh, so, what I want to show to you now is uh, what the Canadian flag looked like before 1965. All right? So, you might have to switch microphones. I'm going to do my little demonstration here. All right. So this was this was the Canadian flag. I think I, do I have it on the right side? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, up until 1965, this was the flag, and the federal government, uh, knowing that uh, the the centennial was coming in 1967, thought that maybe we should change the flag and have it kind of you know upgraded and do something a bit more hunky and uh, you know, more modern. And, um, but uh, the real reason behind this was that uh, it was Lester B. Pearson, uh, who was the, uh, uh, the head of the liberal government in those days. And of course, he had been, re -elect he had been elected mainly by uh, French Canadians from Quebec. And uh, he knew that uh, French Canadians did not identify to this flag. Uh, they didn't really like it because it was way too much red and red was, associ was associated mainly to, to the Brits, uh, and French was associated to blue. And of course, the only blue you could find here is uh, uh, you know, on the, uh, the Union Jack. And the U Union Jack, actually, is a reminder to Quebec people that they've been defeated and that their culture, you know, is, uh, so, so it's, it's, not the best, uh, it's not the best flag to try to involve uh, French Canadians into the great modern project of Canada. And not only that, uh, if you look on this side here, there's the cultural makeup of Canada. In those days, Canada, uh, in Quebec, uh, represented maybe one-third of the population. And on here, it only represents one-fourth. You see, it's uh, Jacques Cartier's golden fleur de lis, uh, next to the uh, Irish harp, uh, next to the Scottish lion uh, with the, uh, the lilies around it, and the three English lions. So um, the interesting thing was also this here, the, the uh, three maple uh, leaves joined to one stem. And I really did my homework, so I really tried to find what that was all about. And the only thing I could find on Wikipedia uh, <laughs> was a reference to somebody who had done a study about uh, uh, heraldy and, 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 and um, protocol and all that, and that actually what it, what it represented was the French, the English, and the others. <laughs> so I looked into the English version of Wikipedia and the French version, and it's the French, the English, and the others. So who are these others, right? Uh, are they, uh, does it refer to the Arabig uh, aboriginals or the immigration, the, Im the immigrants? or what does it refer to? And it's very, very unclear, and it's very, very, very vague. So uh, Pearson thought, well, let's, let's have Quebecers identify to the flag, and let's go for a new design. So he asked um, a group of designers to uh, think about it, and they came up with this marvel here. Okay. Right. So this here, uh, is what we call Lester B. Pearson's pennant, because he was so, so you see it's a much, much uh, lo uh, longer flag, like the Canadian territory, 
What's wonderful about it is that the three colors are the three colors of the two founding nations, right? So you have, you could recognize the French flag in this and the Union Jack. On each side, you have these uh, blue sections uh, that represent uh, the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, which makes a lot of sense because our motto is Ad mare uski an ma, um, from sea to shining sea, I think it is in English. And of course, uh, the three maple leaves joined by the same stem which, of course, is the French, the English, and the others. But, you know, why not Aboriginal? Why not uh, French speakers, English speakers, and people who speak languages from all over the world? Uh, men, women, and the other folks, whatever. But it's a very, very uh, open design. So, of course, uh, Diefen Baker, who was the leader of the opposition, did not like this flag. There was way too much blue in it. And uh, so uh, decided uh, to uh, uh, vote against it and asked for a referendum. Now, uh, Lester B. Pearson uh, was uh, at the head of a minority government and didn't want to risk losing the power over a flag. So, of course, he asked, uh, he asked uh, the designers to go back to the drawing board. And, of course, they came up with the Canadian flag as we know it today, which is all red a bit of white, and uh, one uh, single maple leaf. So I'd, I'd like to bring this to uh, any politician's uh, mind that maybe for the year 2017, for the 150th anniversary of Canada, if there's any a chance or a project of redesigning the Canadian flag, maybe to <laughs> reopen the debate about this flag, which I think is a very, very, with all its flaws, you know, a much open, proposition. This, I think, reflects more what Canada is about or what Canada wants to be about. Um, in, uh, uh, during the uh, Calgary Olympics, I was invited to uh, perform and I was part of a, um, what was a cultural festival. They, have this, they had that also in Vancouver. It's about two weeks before the Olympics. They have this big International Arts Festival, and there's all sorts of forums and gatherings, and they asked journalists from all over the world uh, and, uh, to come to Canada, and they, they traveled through the whole country to try and understand what this country was about. And there was a meeting, and, and uh, there was a rapporteur, somebody who spoke in the name of all these um, reporters, who said, uh, well, what we conclude is that Canada is not one country, it's five countries. Of course, in those days, they, they didn't take into account uh, the territories, the, there were two territories, not three in those days. And um, so they said, you know, we really frankly have the impression that this is not a country, it's the federation of five countries. Um, so a lot of people debated that and people were against and people were for it. And were, but the thing that, that I found interesting is that it, it was, they had an interesting perspective because they were from outside, it was a view from outside and that a way to restructure uh, the, the country or to, to uh, start new debates about the country or uh, you know, constitutional debates. It's, it was refreshing to have a view from outside. And um, in 2008, um, I was in London uh, performing the show, and I don't want to sound like I'm name dropping, but I was having uh, a beer with uh, some of my London friends, so uh, Miranda Richardson and uh, Alan Rickman uh, <laughs> were we're sitting there, and Alan Rickman turns to me and says, hey, Robert, I hear Iggy might be your next prime minister. <laughs> Iggy, who's Iggy? <laughs> and of course he was talking about Michael Ignatieff, and, um, and everybody in London seemed to know him, which was quite interesting, and, uh, and the hip people seemed to know him, and the interesting thinkers seemed to know him, and I had never heard about him before. <laughs> so, so what was interesting, and the reason why I, I and, and for the people who, who in the room don't know who this, this man uh, is, um, he, he was the, the leader of the Liberal Party uh, from 2008 to 2011, I think, during the, uh, um, until the, the uh, federal election of 2011, uh, where he uh, lost to the hands of the present uh, conservative uh, government. And um, the thing that's interesting about Michael Ignatieff <coughs> is that he had a refreshing view, to my taste, he had a refreshing view because he was a guy from the outside for a while. He was a guy who you know, lived in London for a long time and came in with a lot of fresh ideas about what Canada could be. And he did something and said something that I've never heard any 
federal politicians say before, and certainly not in Quebec, um, he was appearing on a TV show uh, that's watched by absolutely everybody in Quebec called Tout le monde en parle on the Sunday, Sunday evenings uh, dr during the federal campaign. And he spoke in an amazing, amazing, and he had an amazing command of the French language with a slight English Canadian accent and had a lot of charm, was funny, a lot of wit, wickedly intelligent. And he, somebody asked him, said, well, what do you think of, of you know, people here in Quebec do not feel Canadian, people feel Quebecois, and he said, well, fine. He said, My, you know, I don't believe in any false patriotism. I think if, you, if you're Quebecois first and Canadians after, it's not, not a problem. You come from Iran, you're or still Iranian first, go for it, and then you're Canadian. That it's not Canadian first. And he was the first one to have this kind of discourse uh, and I never heard that before. And of course, I think it's a pity that, uh, of course, then he kind of vanished into the woodworks of, of politics. And, and I think that there was an interesting debate there of how people feel about Canadian identity. And it's something that I kind of identified to. And the thing that I found that was really cool about this is that we are different countries without a country. We are, and if we can't say country, let's say nations, we are different nations within the same country. It's very practical, actually. If you owe money to someone, or if you you want to uh, trash your girlfriend and you know get rid of her or whatever, and then you want to run away, you go to Vancouver, you know, <laughs> and it's like flying to another country completely, and without the you know without the border patrol and all that stuff. So it's it's a great it's a great thing. Uh, it's a great feeling actually to be and to be a different person um, and it comes back to the whole thing I was saying earlier about uh, uh, feeling different depending on what what language uh, you speak but that's the thing that I find exciting about Canada is that you could be a very different person depending where you go you could have five different lives with five different wives <laughs> in different parts of the of the country and it's great and that's for me is one of the uh, exciting things about uh, about this country. Um, as uh, I'd like to finish off on, on um, something, actually, it's, it came from a question I had this morning. I had um, a radio interview um, with a very interesting man who, who had some very pertinent questions about identity and about belonging, and he asked me about where and when do I feel that I belong? And of course, because we were talking a lot about theater, I said, well, on the stage. But uh, in a I'd say in a broader perspective, I feel uh, I belong uh, somewhere when I feel I'm doing something for my community. Now, of course, you have to know what is a community and what is your community. But after um, I finished my theater school and I started having some kind of relative success in Quebec City, I did what everybody does in theater in Quebec, so I moved to Montreal. And, uh, and I spent five years there. And, uh, and for five years, I did not feel like a Montrealer. It was my language. I had a lot of work opportunities. I was well treated. Um, I wasn't in the shadows. I was in the foreground. But I just did not feel that I belonged there. And it's only when the mayor of Quebec at that time said, well, you know, we have a bit of money. Maybe we could give you. And we have this amazing space that we'd like you to maybe transform into a theater or some kind of theater space, would you consider coming back to Quebec City? And I said, well, okay, I'm, uh, maybe I could do that. And it felt useful. I felt I was at the right place. And I felt that I wasn't a small fish in a big pond. And I was a big fish in a small pond. And whatever I, I would try to achieve or, or whatever I would project that I would start, um, that it would actually have an impact for real. And I would actually see the results. And, and th that's really where I thought, well, this is where I belong. And a sense of community and a sense of reality is it's very difficult to, to define, and I won't bore you uh, f further w with, with exactly why I feel that Quebec City is, is where I belong. But um, I bumped into Michel Tremblay once, um, and pe people were wondering why his plays, who were written in, in a Quebecois dialect for so many years, uh, why they're translated in 34 languages and they're performed in stage all over the world. Um, and he said, well, that's because I, I don't write international stuff. I, wor I write universal stuff. And the more you are local, the more you talk about what you know, the more you try to understand who you are and you're very, very, very 
near uh, community, then you're universal. And unfortunately, we, we're in a culture, we're encouraged to be international. Uh, I remember going on tours and, and performing a play like uh, Far Side of the Moon that's set in Quebec City, and people would ask me when I'd come back, oh, um, well, did you change all the names of the newspapers? And did you change this? And why? Because people there don't understand that our newspaper is a different name than their newspaper. So there's this thing where, where we're... Uh, um, we're in a culture where, uh, for example, I, I get all these uh, film scripts sent at me to, uh, either as an actor or as a, as a director, and it often starts by the action takes place in a place that could be Toronto, could be New York, it could be San Francisco, it could be London. And it sucks because it's nowhere. It's, it, and, and a good story has a sense of place. And, when, and that's what... Hitchcock used to do, you know, the birds start, it's in San Francisco, and uh, Psycho starts in Phoenix, Arizona. And, and when you have a sense of place, then there's a, a, a sense of values and morals that come with that place, there's a system, there's a language, there's a decor, and um, unfortunately, we're in a culture where we're kind of all kind of making this vague blob, you know, <laughs> once again. So um, I'd say the more you are local, the more you are universal, and that's your real identity. So I thank you very much. Oh, you do. <laughs> the, um, that, was, that was really wonderful. And let me just, uh, at first, a sentence I forgot to say when I was speaking before you, which was, which was that uh, emigration from, forced from England of sick Irish people, which led to the, our becoming a democracy, the first law passed by the new Canadian government in January or February 1848 was an immigration bill. So the first thing democracy did in Canada was to, excuse me for putting it this way, throw the British out, to tell them they couldn't have an immigration policy and that we would have an immigration policy. And that whatever we'd been doing since then has been based on <coughs> that bill, which was actually based on defining the ports of Quebec City. Because it was all about the private sector from Britain were landing uh, the emigrants in places where they had to pay extra taxes and they would come in September, which meant they'd freeze to death in the winter and all sorts of things. Anyway, um, so uh, we're going to have questions and the idea is that we'll take three or four at once, maybe two on either side and then Robert will do whatever he wants with your brilliance. And, um, uh, uh, but, but, so that thing, you, but just while you're getting organized to go and stand at Mike's, uh, uh, the thing you said about the languages bring something out in you that's already there, bring out these different mm -hmm. personalities in you. And I think that's just such an interesting thing as a way of, first of all, talking about bilingualism in Canada, that mm -hmm. kids don't do it to get a higher income, which is what mm -hmm. they're told all the time in school, that they're actually re revealing themselves by doing mm -hmm. it. So did you become conscious of that at a, quite fast, or did that sort of come to you very late on, that that was what was happening, all these different languages were no, bringing something was, out in you? Well, from the moment you put them in practice, from the moment you're in a real conversation, a different language with somebody else, and you, and you see yourself gesturing differently, and you see yourself having a different energy. And uh, at first you think it's something that you're, you're taking from the language, that <coughs> you're imitating the, the American cool or the whatever, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the uh, but, 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 but you eventually understand that it's something that comes from within. That's who you are. That's part, that's part of who you are. We, I was working on a, um, a show once. Uh, I was devising a show uh, with a uh, wonderful actress uh, from uh, north of England. And um, you know, she spoke like this. And she was very, very kind of very cold. And uh, her, her father was a bishop. And she, she it seemed as if she didn't have any sex in her life. And she was very young. <laughs> so, and, but of course, she had worked as an au pair when she was younger. Um, in Spain, 
and she was fluent. Uh, she spoke uh, fluent. And at one point we said, well, maybe does somebody speak Spanish here so we could do this character? And she said, well, I speak Spanish. And then she played this extraordinary kind of, you know, lady who's <laughs> resolved. And, and went, nobody knew you had that in you. And that was only triggered by uh, the, the English, uh, the Spanish, uh, the Spanish language. So, so it is something. It, it is, uh, and I think that in, uh, I don't want to be too, uh, too crass, but I think <laughs> in, in um, a lot of shrinks should actually <laughs> use this sometimes to have other people's personalities come out, you know, instead of always saying, what does this remind you, you know, <laughs> 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 you know, to say, well, say, say it in another language, say it in your words, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, I think it's an, an extraordinary, uh, and, and do you think, I mean, Quebec City's changed so much because, of mm -hmm. course, people don't have to speak English for the wrong reasons anymore, mm -hmm. um, uh, and in, in many ways it's, it's Franco uh, Fran uh, French first language almost all the time, mm -hmm. unless you're in the tourism business. Yeah, extent. exactly. But and that's an odd way of bringing yeah, in but that we have second a, language. We have a different relationship with the English language in Quebec City than Montreal. Montreal, for a long time, it was a class thing. Of course, pe if, you know, if people were rich, they probably spoke English, and if they were poorer, they spoke French. Because that all evolved and changed, and that picture's all changed. But in the 60s, that's pretty much what it was. Uh, we didn't have that in Quebec City. Um, and, and a lot of the, the rich English uh, Families uh, chose to live in Quebec City to, to also to speak French. They would speak French with, with uh, very thick English accents, but still, they would you know they were very proud of, of speaking French. And, and the uh, Irish community, uh, most of them spoke a good French. And uh, somebody did a survey at one point on uh, Irish culture in Quebec City today, and there's all these, you know, the phone book is full of all these Irish names, and most of them don't even speak English anymore. I mean, some of them have married and kept the name and all that. So, so there's still the trace of the Irish culture, but it's not necessarily connected to the English language anymore. And you don't, one of the, now, are you being shy, or this is very odd that you're not, do we have to bring the mics to you, which we can also do, if you want to put your hands up, but I'm just waiting for you here. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Um, the, one of the odd things I've always thought about, particularly Quebec City, is there was that enormous input of, of Germans in the 18th century into, mm -hmm. into New France, which just disappeared. I mean, I think they all married yeah. French Canadian girls, and yeah, there's maybe. almost the Christmas tree was introduced into North America <laughs> yeah. by Germans in the, the uh, late 18th century, mm -hmm. supposedly. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh, it's interesting because the, the, the uh, cultural makeup of Quebec City, of course, has, has, has evolved uh, a lot, and today, um, what's, what I find really interesting is that um, a lot of the French-speaking immigrants or people who come from countries where French was either the first language or the second language immigrated to, to uh, Quebec City, Quebec City and Montreal, but mainly Quebec City. So a lot of people from North Africa, Moroccans, Algerians, mm. people from Tunisia, um, have immigrated to uh, Quebec City and all in one block. So suddenly overnight there was a lot of people um, some of them would open, uh, uh, you know, uh, s some some uh, Moroccan restaurants and things like that. But a lot of them now uh, own the um, the taxi business. So you take a taxi in Quebec City nowadays. Chances are, nine cases out of ten, you will have uh, somebody from uh, the the Maghrebian uh, part of the world. Uh, most of them are people who studied to become engineers lawyers, um, they all have point of views on, on politics and all that, but most of them uh, have uh, l uh, could have uh, led liberal jobs, uh, but of course in the meantime are being offered jobs in the taxi. And they have the best conversations ever because they're literate, they're intelligent, they have a different point of view, they come from a part of the world where they've dealt with some of the problems or realities that we're dealing with now. Um, so, so, it's, so it's what what you bring to the community, I think that's important, that makes the make, and, and that's what Quebec City is now. It's become, of course, it's more connected to the French speaking, uh, yeah. a lot of people from Vietnam uh, for a while, because the second language was, uh, was French for in, in the north of Vietnam. So um, it, it's, 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 it's interesting to see how, uh, because Quebec before did not have, like Montreal, very specific uh, ethnic communities. So I'm gonna ask one last thing, which is what you said is, I mean, I think we all, uh, uh, writers, et cetera, agree that, that, that 
if something's really good, mm -hmm. it has to be totally local to become universal. Mm -hmm. The worst thing is this banality of internationalism. Mm -hmm. And, but a lot of people do it because they think they have to do it for funding, which is yeah. a terrible mistake, or insecurity, because mm -hmm. they think themselves as coming from a blog. Yeah. Yeah, um, exactly, yeah. And I mean, how, so saying it is a really important thing. Having you say it is a really mm -hmm. important thing. I mean, maybe there are people out here who have something to do with the film business who will say, we will mm -hmm. refuse anything that says this could take place yeah, in the yeah. following five cities. Yeah. You know, but I mean, uh, how do we convince people that this is not, apart from repeating it endlessly, that, that the universal is profoundly local, yeah. and the more local it is, the more universal it might become? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it depends also on uh, uh, what part of the, the cultural industry we're, we're talking about. I think that's something that's uh, certainly in, in the television world and in a, in a certain commercial cinema, that's how uh, these things operate. People will say, well, if you want the money, it has to be in English. And, uh, well, no complicated Polish names. And, you know, they, <laughs> they come up with stuff where you go, what? Uh, it might not be that reality in the theater and, and, and in uh, the performing arts in, in general. Of course, I, so I'm, I'm generalizing yeah. when I'm saying that. But, you know, um, the Cannes Film Festival is a very prestigious French institution, right? And, and they opened the festival one year with a film called Vatel. Vatel was the great Louis XIV chef. Right. right, he's one of the inventors of gastronomy, and it's set in Versailles with all of with Louis for the Fourteenth, and uh, you have all of the you know the great French uh, kings and queens and princes and duchess and all of that. So, um, but of course uh, they have Gérard Depardieu playing uh, Vatel, and all the other. And it's a co-production with the U.S. and uh, and you have you know American and British actors playing all the other French kings and queens, and it's all in English. And the only one that has a French accent is Gérard Depardieu. <laughs> and it's the oddest thing ever. <laughs> and you just sit there and it's, it's about, you know, French cuisine during the Versailles years. And, you know, and you see Brad Pitt playing the Comte. <laughs> and it just doesn't make any sense, <laughs> you know? So, I don't know. Uh, so, and, and people are doing that more and more and they don't realize how, how terrible that is, but. Ma'am. Hello. Um, so enjoyed this. I have to say that I felt that um, you were illustrating and articulating my personal story. I'm French and, uh, French Canadian and English. French Canadian father, last name Drapeau, mm -hmm. um, uh, who was military, married a British woman. Um, an interesting uh, anecdote, uh, my father passed away uh, uh, about five, six years ago, and um, uh, our French-Canadian family only realized um, uh, after his death that because he had not, uh, because he had married a, a British woman or an English woman, uh, that we weren't inherently wealthy. And uh, uh, it was quite a revelation that mm -hmm. after 50 years of marriage, um, uh, I realized that my French-Canadian family assumed, because of all of the, uh, all of the story that you've illustrated, uh, that we were, um, you know, at its base, wealthy because mm -hmm. we spoke English. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, find, uh, I find it just very interesting that your own personal story has also illustrated that. And uh, it's. Pr um, so is that the question? It's a good question. I mean. Yeah, it's not just necessarily. Just so we can move on to the right, next person. It's just yeah. not necessarily a question. It's just that it's, mm -hmm. uh, I think, to this date, still something that's quite relevant in Canadian culture. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Yes. Hi there. Hi. Thank you very much for being here. I greatly appreciate being able to be a part of this and learn so much from you. Um, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I'm a, I'm a Canadian actor, actually, and uh, move your mic up a bit. Up a little bit. I'm a Canadian. I should just project. I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make your voice resound in the round bowl of your pelvis. <laughs> uh, so I'm a, I'm a Canadian actor and an arts producer. Uh, I currently have a one-man show that I've been creating over the last two years, and I play about 15 different characters in it. It spans about 40 years, and um, all of a sudden I have this opportunity to potentially go. Uh, to an international place. I want to drive myself to push forward there. But I don't know as a Canadian creator what my place is in the international community. I wanted to ask you how you got the chutzpah and, and how you 
pushed yourself to say, I have a voice on the international stage? Let's take two more very quickly, and then, yes. Yes, uh, hi, uh, I am uh, Michi, and I'm an actor-director as well, and uh, great to be here. And uh, my, 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 my question is, and, and what I'm really curious about, like, is that you think it's going to be a time when, when people and the people in the theater business and the uh, art form, I don't know in Quebec, but I, as I see in Toronto, I just moved here a couple of years ago and I became a citizen uh, just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. And, uh, you know, like, uh, when, when everybody can be represented and, and here, like, I'm just not fond of it when you go see theaters and they try to do, like, fake accent, like, Canadian actors try to be like European or Eastern European or somewhere else and they, they do it so phony and it's just, uh, it's, I don't understand like why they don't represent the people mm -hmm. around the street. If you just walk around in Toronto, there's so many different accents, so many different colors and you don't see that much. I mean a little bit opened up but you don't see it in TV and film. Like, like for example, what I grew up and I see in Europe like Peter Brook company has people all around the world and they all try to speak English and you don't understand a word what they're saying but the play they do Shakespeare and it's just amazing and you don't care about the language really because what they do uh, actors and how they create it it's just amazing and so beautiful like there's a, actors from Korea there's from from Africa there's like a Polish actor who plays Krishna and you don't understand what they're saying because of the accent they have so ha heavy accent and it makes sense. So, you think it's, there's a time when we see that in Canadian mm -hmm. stage and Canadian films? And then let's take a last one here. Hello. Um, I'm a musician and composer who never had any time for story. And in the last few years, I've become very involved with it in a community context and in my work. Actually, Sebastian and I have worked on a piece together. But um, my question to you is. Uh, what is your sense of the power of story, both to teach us who we are, um, uh, to connect us to each other, but also to discover where we're headed in terms of telling the story of where we're going individually, in our communities, and as a country? So, Robert, then we'll see if we can get four more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's a lot of stuff, but I mean, there, there are some recurring themes in here, uh, for sure. Um, I think that um, I'm always talking about Australia because I always compare Australia to Canada, but I mean, it, it, in Commonwealth countries, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of similarities, and certainly in the theater milieu or in the cultural milieu, uh, there is this sense of that um, we're still very colonized in the sense that we don't think that our stories are worthy of telling, uh, they're worthy of telling locally, but as soon as, you know, it, it doesn't really deserve international attention. We, we do have a colonial attitude. And that's still pretty much uh, uh, present. And I'd say that one of the, the great, uh, I'd say, prize of, of um, in, uh, in French Canadian culture for a while is that um, way before English Canada, uh, we we started to abandon the idea that uh, uh, you had to have a French accent uh, to be um, artistic director of a theater company. That we eventually we got that. No, no, but really we, we got rid of that earlier than English Canada. In English Canada, for a long time, um, if, if you were artistic director of uh, an opera company, a theater company, a theater festival, very often there was a British accent in the back there. And that slowly kind of evolved, and, and there's more confidence. I feel there's more confidence now, uh, and you have people who, who don't feel they have to have um, uh, that, that, that makeup, uh, that, that they could actually um, be strong artistic directors or, or directors or actors or so so but it's a long process it's a very 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 long process and, and uh, uh, you know I, I myself um, uh, became um, uh, I'd say uh, an international uh, success by chance it's because I came to Toronto because I'm answering to one of the questions is that I we, we perform Dragon's Trilogy here and here at that point there was a lot of people from all over the world and there was the Toronto audience and there was people who had a different take on what it is that we were trying to say and, and it just made it glow and it exploded and, and that's often what I say when I go to theater schools or, or the people who write shows or go and show your stuff elsewhere. Uh, sometimes you're, you're 
you have to talk about your community, but your community is not necessarily the, your best audience. Um, you know, there's, um, I know this, this uh, great violinist um, who uh, tours the world and plays in the greatest concert halls, but that Christmas they asked her to take her violin out and her family and to play some Quebecois Rigodon, and, <laughs> and everybody's appalled how she's not a good violinist. You know, <laughs> you know, so, so that's the thing, is that when you're at home, you know, people see the smallness in you. And when you're abroad, people are prepared to see to see uh, uh, another dimension to who you are. It's interesting. Dimension. Now we're going to do kind of haiku here. Which we, if we get two more questions in on either side, but really fast, so Robert has a chance to reply. Robert, you're a person of great imagination. And if we're to fast forward to 2017 for our sesquicentennial, what would your advice be to Canadian artists on the world stage to your point of being inter uh, universal mm -hmm. instead of international? Que ça marche, comme ça. Ok. Comme New Québécoise et comme mère d'un Québécoise, moi, je aimerais poser mes questions en français. Oui. Et bon, c'est toujours, j'ai toujours l'impression que comme Québec, comme New Québécoise, on, on doit choisir pour nos enfants comment, comment exprimer notre culture, ça qu'on qu convient avec quand on arrive. Oui. En plus, la culture québécoise commence à prendre et en plus la culture canadienne. Comment on peut mélanger les trois mm -hmm. et effectivement, si, si, quelles sont vos idées uh, sur ces sujets? Okay. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, to answer the, the, uh, the question about what to say to um, Can Canadian artists on, on the world, uh, world stage, um, besides all the stuff I said before about, you know, trying to, don't, don't be afraid to describe and to talk about your own reality. But there's something, uh, you also have to imagine, imagine that you're gonna be, uh, what, what you do is going to be uh, seen and heard by people sometimes who don't understand your language, uh, but who care, who want to understand what it is that you're about. They don't, who, they don't understand your culture, but are ready to identify to who you are, even though it's exotic to them. Um, there's a very open, intelligent audience out there. And, but people here are used to certainly uh, script writers for films or for plays or radio plays. They're used to going through this, uh, uh, th these people either at, uh, uh, I don't know, whoever, whoever has the control of, of, of broadcasting or, or producing. And, and very often they say, hmm, interesting project, but what will that little farmer on his farm in Saskatchewan think of what you're, you're doing? And, and people, are, people are kind of, uh, in, in, in that mindset, and, and you want to say to these writers, you know, that those are the people here who expect that from you, but outside, um, you know, people just want to fly, people want to, um, they want to learn, uh, they're interested in who you are by the, uh, by your take on it, by your external point of view on it, so, um, and not to try to think that audiences are the same all over the world. Um, you know, th there are places where my work doesn't, my work doesn't work. There are places where my work and some really bad shows that I've performed here that are a triumph somewhere. There are different audiences. There are different sensitivities. There is a, a sensitivity of the north, of the south, of the, there's all of that. So if you haven't found your audience yet, it's somewhere in the world. You can be sure about that. <laughs> and you can't really explain it, but you know, you do. I, I did a show called, uh, well, The Far Side of the Moon, uh, which is a very local show when it started because it was about, uh, you know, two siblings, uh, their jealousy and their 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 uh, their vanity and 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 trying to r trying to reconcile, and um, you know, and we toured it and it was it had a, a very good uh, success pretty much everywhere where it uh, it performed. But when we played in Korea, it was this huge phenomenon, and we didn't understand exactly what it was about. But of course, in Korea, you know, um, two siblings. Uh, quarreling and trying to find ways to reconcile meant something very, very, very important and fundamental. So what it, whatever it is that you, you talk about, it will find an extra meaning depending on the audience where you're performing. Don't expect people to get the message that you're trying to convey. They, they, they'll find their own messages and you might not be responsible of that message, but what it is is that your work is the trigger to these messages. Which is why the local truth has to be there. 
Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and, and people will project onto that their own uh, preoccupations and their own kind of... And, and uh, as for the, the, uh, uh, the question about um, trying to, to uh, reconcile uh, your, your um, original uh, culture if you're an immigrant and you, you certainly, uh, a place like Quebec is an interesting place because not only you come here, you want to speak English because the continent speaks English, but at the same time the local culture is French. So you have to find, it, you have to make choices. And, 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 um, and I, I always find that extremely, extremely rich. And I always think that um, you should never ask your children to um, take on the local culture only. You should encourage them to bring your culture to their schools, to, to uh, not to shy away from showing that things are different where you come from and who you are. And, and uh, so, uh, but in, in general, people try to fit in. And uh, there's nothing more interesting than not fitting in. And, um, and it's also this thing that um, we're, we're in a society that is teaching us, uh, not teaching us, but is forcing us to try to be number one. Um, and I always say, well, it's, it's a very, very, very thin way of looking at the world, trying to be number one. Why don't you try to be unique? That's a very different thing. And, and I think that if you come from another country, from another culture, uh, that you come in, that your, your parents uh, speak a, a language, and, 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 but the local kids, you, you want to take part of the world you're in and all that, it'll make you a very unique person. And I think that that's what you have to aim for. It, it, you know, what I, it's this idea, I think, in Canada that you can have more than one personality. Yeah, what absolutely. I, what I call a multiple personality order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the more personalities you can have, yeah. the more interesting you are, uh -huh. in a sense. So let's just quiet. I think we're almost out. But we just ask you the question after 2017. Yeah, what should people do? In two, yes, what should artists do about 2017? You mean for the uh, 150th, 150th anniversary. anniversary? Well, besides the flag that I showed you earlier, <laughs> which I still think <laughs> would, be a good, would be a good idea. Um, I, I think that um, there's something about Canada, uh, the way we see Canada, when we celebrate Canada, is that we're always trying to show how uh, we're doing what, what uh, a European country that has thousands of years of history behind them. We talk about the past and we talk about the, you know, the roots and, and that's all very fine because we should be proud of where we come from. But Canada is a very young country and it should project itself into the future. And, and, and as I said uh, during the talk is that it's, what's great about this country is that it's, uh, there's a lot of room and, and, and everything is to be invented. And then if there was a way for artists to express that, that is, it's a place where, it's a place that projects itself um, ahead of the curve. You know? I've been told that if you can bear, we're, are you, uh, you can ask them afterwards or if you're coming to the round table, but we're apparently out of time here. Uh, but um, first, we're, we're going, from, there are about 125 people who uh, got the f seats for the round table discussions that are taking place at the Gardner Museum. And for those of you who don't know, you go out the front door, you turn left, and you turn right, you're at the Gardner Museum. It's a four minute walk, three minute walk. Um, and I'm sorry for those of you who didn't get those tickets in time, but find out who's going and phone them up and find out what happened, I don't know. <laughs> But uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Robert. C'est vraiment un